First up is how to give your minions elixirs. This can be incredibly powerful on a minion like the Water Elemental, which uses its strength modifier in both its attack and damage rolls for many of its abilities. By selecting your minion and hitting tab, you can use potions and elixirs and it will apply them to your minion. As you can see, the Water Elemental's strength modifier doubles when it has the Elixir of Cloud Giant strength applied. This makes it much harder for enemies to succeed saving throws against its spells and it deals much more damage. The Water Elemental also has a lot of health, so it's not a bad idea to give it an elixir each time you summon it, if you have extras laying around. You can also use this to keep a minion alive by having them drink your healing potions, whether that's Glut because you like animating spores, or other summoned minions. And next up is how to cause an AoE fear each turn using a secret combo. The Bow of the Banshee on hit has a chance to inflict Frightened and gives you a 1d4 bonus to attack and damage rolls against frightened creatures. However, there is a way to cause cause this fear effect in an area of effect by using this with Horde Breaker. This Hunter Ranger weapon action shoots your target and marks the targets around that target with the Horde Breaker condition. And this condition causes them to possibly become frightened when it probably shouldn't. You can then follow up with the Horde Breaker bonus attack and reap the rewards of the frightened condition on that second target that didn't even get shot yet. This is a pretty handy combo, especially when other teammates can benefit from the enemy's ultimate also being frightened. And if you like that tip, don't forget to click like and subscribe for more Baldur's Gate 3 videos. And next up is how to get infinite spell slots, the easy way. In Act 2, there is a shield that you can buy from Tally and Last Light Inn called the Shield of Devotion. This shield, when equipped, grants you an extra spell slot. However, if you have no more spell slots and then take it off and re-equip, it will give you a new spell slot to use. By using this on a sorcerer, you're able to give yourself an unlimited amount of sorcery points by converting the level 1 spell slot that you get from the shield into a sorcery point, unequipping the shield and then re-equipping it and converting the spell slot again and again into sorcery points. Once you have enough sorcery points, you can then restore all your spell slots and rinse and repeat as needed. This can be a very powerful shield indeed in the hands of a sorcerer. And next up is a new trader trick for Hotfix23 to get all their stuff for free. You'll need two bags for this trick. First, sell one empty bag to the trader, put all the stuff you want into their bag, and it's important that you put at least two items in that bag for it to work, then open the bag you still own and drag all the stuff from their bag into the icon of your container. And it's very important to remember the icon, not the open slots below the icon. And then that's it. You now have all their stuff and it works as of Hotfix 23. If you're on console, this probably won't work for you. And next up is how to one-shot Orin and skip the entire Ball Temple fight. If you get a character with at least 20 strength and cast Enlarge on them, guidance and invisibility, you can just walk up to Orin and throw her off the edge. Now as easy as that sounds, there is a bit of a trick to it. You need to stand pretty much exactly on the corner of the altar of Ball, and when you mouse over it, your cursor is going to turn into a lock, which will cause you to interact with it instead of moving on top of it. And you can actually get around this by just holding down the shift key, and then you're able to move right on top of it, kind of in the corner. Once you're there, just use throw and then select right where the cat is closest to you and you'll see Orin's portrait turn red. That's how you know that the throw will be fatal. Then just execute the throw. Once Orin's dead, grab the nether stone off the ground and then join Orin in the pit of death, killing your character, which lets you skip the entire fight. Assuming, of course, you ungrouped your party and the rest of them are left somewhere else safe. And next up is a strange interaction with arcane turrets. These stationary constructs first appear in Act 1 defending the arcane tower. Constructs are made instead of born and in the case of these turrets, simply follow a simple set of instructions. Blast enemies. So it will probably come as a surprise that the spell Tasha's Hideous Laughter will work on them considering they don't have mouths to laugh from nor bodies to fall prone upon. This level 1 spell can buy you enough time to sneak by and it's pretty hilarious hearing laughter after casting the spell on the turrets considering they are literally metallic constructs. And next up is the only weapon that can deal bludgeoning damage with sneak attack. Most finesse weapons do not deal bludgeoning damage except for one, the Practice Sword. This short sword deals bludgeoning damage and since sneak attack inherits the damage type from your weapon, you can use this to deal bludgeoning damage with your sneak attacks. This can be very helpful against bosses that are vulnerable to bludgeoning like Grim, and these blades are very easy to get early on. They can be found in the hollow of the Druid's Grove, right near where Will is training the tieflings to fight, but you are going to have to steal them, so be prepared to use Fog 
analog and other trickery to get these extremely unique weapons. And next up is an amulet so useful that you'll want to get it every playthrough. This amulet grants you a divination cantrip that gives you plus 1d4 to all ability checks and can be used during dialogue. This amulet is the silver pendant, which grants the guidance cantrip. This pendant is a must if you don't have a druid or cleric in your party, since you can use it with virtually all ability checks, and the best part is you can find it extremely early into the game. To get the silver pendant, just head southwest of the druid grove in act one, and then you'll need to jump on a rocky ledge or two and then climb a ladder. At the top, there will be a skeleton where you'll find this amulet. And if you pass the history check, you'll notice it has a harper symbol on it. And next up is how to unlock a hidden room by sitting down. Underneath the toll house in act one on the risen road, there is a basement. This basement has a number of traps and items, but it also has a secret hidden room. And the door to this hidden room can only be opened by sitting in a special chair. Two chairs, in fact. On the northwest side of the toll house basement, there are two stone chairs, each with a hidden pressure plate. And by having a character sit in each at the same time, only then will the door open. And inside that secret room, you can find the gloves of heroism. Now these gloves grant warding hands. When you use a channel oath spell, you gain heroism, making you immune to frightened and granting five temporary hit points per turn. Not bad at all. And next up is a hidden use for Karlak's head. It turns out it can actually be used as a key. This head comes from completing the quest Hunt the Devil for the Paladins of Tyr. You'll need to defeat Karlak and then remove her head as proof of the deed. Once you have her head, this item is orange rarity, meaning it's a story item, but instead of bringing it back to Anders, you can actually use it as a key to unlock a secret room. In Act 2, within Balthazar's room, there's a bookshelf that can be interacted with in order to reveal an ancient altar. This altar can have an item inserted into it, and when Karlak's head is placed into it, the bookshelf opens, revealing a secret room. Inside this room, there's a ritual circle that Gale can use to create a shadow lantern or gain Mistra's blessing. And although you can insert a heart from one of the corpses on the ground into the ancient altar, and that will work just as well, it's really interesting that the ancient altar also accepts Karlak's head as well. Now at this point, it seems that the ancient altar will accept almost any body part or organ, regardless of where it comes from, but very interesting indeed. And next up are the sabotaged explosives. There's a special set of smoke powder bombs that will always explode in the hands of the thrower when thrown from the ground. These sabotaged smoke powder bombs can be found in Act 2 within the Last Light Inn, sold by Quartermaster Tali. However, it's only the first stack of bombs she sells. All the bombs after refreshing her stock will behave normally. But why do they explode in your hands? Probably because throwing them on the ground is not the intended way to throw smoke powder bombs, since you can throw them as a stack when you do that. Either that, or Tali secretly doesn't like it being thrown that way and is intentionally sabotaging the bombs to not work like that. However, most likely, it's just a bug. And next up is how to save the hyena in Act 2. Right as you enter the ruined battlefield in a approach the camp of Absolute, waiting to be escorted through the Shadow Curse, a cutscene will trigger and you'll have a goblin telling the hyena to fetch a bone in the Shadow Curse. If you choose to just observe, this leads to the hyena dying to the Shadow Curse. But if you ask him what he's doing, you can change the topic and keep the hyena alive. Then you can interact with the hyena and persuade it to leave. You'll need to pass an ability check or two, depending on if you have speak with animals, but you can convince the hyena to leave the goblins, and if he does, you'll end up saving his life. And now Next up is how to load up on all the beneficial conditions you could ever want without long resting. You can get Shield of Thralls on every party member, Drake Throat Glaive Enchantment on every weapon, Heroes Feast without using spell slots, aid, and much more. To do this, all you need to do is head to the Boudoir in the House of Hope in Act 3. In there, you'll find a bath with a restoration faucet that restores you as if you had a long rest when used. However, most players will lose access to this faucet by progressing through the House of hope. But if you just never steal the Orphic Hammer, nor trigger any of the pressure plates, then Raphael will never be alerted, and you can come and go from the House of Hope as you want, reapplying all the conditions you want. The only item you'll really miss out on if you do this is the Helldusk Armor, but you'll gain access to these faucets for the remainder of the game, which can be very, very helpful. 